independent design review panel. We are three of those. There's about 130, 140 uh, people that sit on that panel across the UK. I'm an architect and town planner for my sins and uh, worked over 30 years in an uh, architectural practice that also had a planning uh, division. Jonathan, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah, so yeah, my name's John Vernon Smith. Um, I'm a chartered architect, uh, but mostly an urban designer. I work in private practice predominantly, producing sort of master planning urban design projects nationwide. I also front number sort of planning appeals. And um, I sit, I've been sitting on this design review panel for about 10 years, reviewing all sorts of schemes, mostly with sort of urban design input, but anything from sort of one-off houses to student housing and infrastructure projects. Hi, I'm Louise Ball. I'm a chartered landscape architect. Um, I'm a director of a small practice in Somerset called Swampool Partnership, where as a practice we've been together for 40 years. Um, I've been there for about 15. Um, I've worked in public charity in the days of groundwork and private practice. And I've been, like I say, with, with uh, uh, Swampool now for 15 years as a, as a director there. Like Jonathan, I've been on the design review panel for over 10 years and have looked at a multitude of schemes, especially as a landscape architect. We promote high quality and sustainable design. Secondly, we are in independent and impartial feedback. We have no contracts uh, with uh, developers or local authorities or anybody whatsoever. We are employed simply to do a design review and that's been successful for the last 10 years, contributed by these two and many others. The panel members' selection is anonymous until you see them at the panel day which we think is a good thing because then people don't see, try and get round the back door to, to, to sort of influence. Not that they would, of course. Multidisciplinary expertise. So you've got an urban designer, a landscape architect and myself today, but uh, we vary that depending on, or the uh, chairman of the panel varies that depending on the, the type of scheme and what's required. No ongoing contracts with that local authorities or developers, so they've got no influence upon us and what we do. Reduce the burden for local authorities because it's on the developer to employ uh, the design review panel if they so choose. And then separation from uh, the decision maker. But last and uh, not least is that we are very independent. And just to give you an indication, this was uh, a recent planning appeal where the inspector made it very clear that they do take design review panels uh, views very seriously. Um, I'm just going to start by introducing the, the case study, which is going to be the sort of larger part of our presentation this afternoon. The, the site, as Bill mentioned before the break, is within the Stonygate Conservation Area, which is in Leicester, and that's just sort of south of the, um, the city centre. Radcliffe Road, which we'll talk about, is sort of south of the, the red line that you can see on there, so it's the, the sort of linear, most linear part of the site. And the proposals that we're going to be talking about are for the construction of four three-storey buildings, which will include 94 retirement apartments uh, with a care facility, uh, and all of the associated landscaping, access roads, parking, and communal facilities that come with that sort of facility. The site as it is at the moment, as you can see, this is the existing, the site is existing, contains a number of buildings. These buildings, which largely date from the 1970s, with the exception of, there's, there's one thrown in there just to, um, to frustrate me, which is the, uh, the, the listed building, which is the, the, the middle one underneath the large picture. But the, the, the buildings on site are 1970s, and, and the applicant for this design review panel, because this is a, a, a presentation that was made to us, were considered to be of sort of very limited architectural um, importance. Uh, they'd also been, they'd suffered from a lot of vandalism, and they'd fallen into disrepair. So the, the applicant took the view that um, these buildings should be removed before their proposals. As mentioned, this, the site sits within the conservation area, the Stonygate Conservation Area, and it's renowned for its sort of Victorian and Edwardian villas. There are a number of Grade 2 and Grade 2 star listed buildings close to the site, um, and the setting um, added the opportunity for the applicant and a challenge for the design uh, to respect and enhance the character of this conservation area whilst providing a sort of modern, functional living environment for future residents. So this area provides the context for the proposals which were presented. The project team during the design review panel session were tasked, of course, with presenting a proposal which would integrate with this character of the conservation area. And the team presented the, a, a constraints plan of the site, which is on the slide. And the, what the image shows is the key elements that were discussed in the review. These were 
the buildings and the massing uh, relative to the context. So you can see the context of the conservation area, these large villas around the site, and then the buildings on the site itself, which present, as you can see, a very different sort of massing and, and uh, relationship to um, the surroundings. And then the, the, the sort of other key element which the um, plan identifies is the, the landscape and public realm elements of the site. The applicant presented a number of initial concepts and the initial challenges related to scale and massing and how these new buildings would fit into the existing urban grain. And there are three initial um, concepts presented. And then during the review itself, the concerns that were raised were this, the visual impact of the building on the, the large building footprints on the site. And the discussion revolved around the need to break up these long facades along Ratcliffe Road, which is the sort of bottom edge of these plans. And thirdly, as, as previously mentioned, how the landscape and um, green spaces integrate with the development to um, contribute to the placemaking of the, of the proposal. So this slide simply illustrates the, the proposal that was subject to design review or the first session, and the, the plan on the right is the initial plan that resulted from these early concepts that were presented, which were shown on the previous slides. So those ended up being that. The slide here shows the initial proposal on the left, and, the, and the, one of the sort of key listed buildings on the right, which is the grey two-star listed Inglewood House. And the slide, I suppose, just serves to contrast between the, the architectural style of the proposal with the sort of challenge of the conservation area. So this is what the panel said. So we advise on simplifying the detailing and um, thinking about a sort of a unified materials palette. Brilliant. Louise is going to talk about the landscape. Um, we often find that when a landscape consultant has been used um, or presents schemes with a, uh, with a larger team, that the schemes are much more successful when they bring them to the DRP. Obviously, I'm going to say that's a landscape architect, but, but you know, the early design process is quite important for, for landscape architecture, and uh, it should be really integral to the overall scheme. It creates a cohesive space, it enhances biodiversity, and also contributes most of all to a sense of place. Although on the first review, the team that brought the, 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 to the panel didn't have a landscape architect in place, and that, although they did carry out some site analysis work, it didn't have anything that related to the landscape generally on, in, and or the, uh, the conservation area from the onset. So that cohesive environment that can, could have fostered a community or an interaction or reinforced the identity of the site was missing. We feel like they, let, they missed that landscape-led approach and the spaces between the development were lost and there wasn't anything really to inform them. The first, as part of that first review, uh, we encouraged them to perhaps come back to us again uh, with a landscape team in place, of which they did do. And the difference was, was quite considerable in that second review. They, they, that, in that second review, the landscape team worked a lot more closely with the architecture team and there was, you could see there was a bit more of a, a landscape-led team. There was definitely a sense of place between the buildings and at ground level. And you could also see some more sustainability taken into account. Although, as I said, the, the architects had produced a site constraints plan, the landscape architect did identify other issues. And one of the main ones really is the effect this scheme would have on the conservation area. And in particular, the trees around it and the trees within it and neighbouring uh, listed buildings, neighbouring properties, overlooking them. They also had to take into account utilities, lighting restrictions. They were quite lucky, this, this site is quite level. So that, that's quite, you know, as a, as a positive for the scheme. They helped to explore, and this then slotted into the part of the architect's design. We're very lucky with the design review panel. Normally we get invited to site. And so normally the first, uh, part of the design review, if it's like a whole day or four, four hour session, is we get to go on site and walk around site. And that gives you the idea, that sense of place, what that, you know, you get that feeling, you get that gut feeling. And I'm sure as planners yourself, as you know, if you walk around site, you get that feeling about what is actually, what it feels like. And it's a really useful part of the design review process. I think also the benefit on the, the scheme was the local authority were involved and they were qu quite keen to be part of that design review process as well. So we, you, you get to get a, a sort of a really broad view of everything. 
the trees were a huge uh, impact on this scheme. There was a lot of mature species on site. And in the first review, it was quite obvious that they were thinking about where the building was going rather than trying to retain as much of the tree canopy as possible. Now, I think we, we talked earlier about you know, good landscape and bad landscape, and it's not necessarily about keeping every single tree, but keeping the quality or the cover is, 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 is essential to a, to a successful scheme. Um, if I really think a tree is not going to be benefit to the scheme, it's not adding anything to the overall scheme. A, don't try and preserve it, or do try and preserve it. I think if it's getting in the way, sometimes on, on, on previous schemes where we've had a really large beech tree, say, and they're trying to build a scheme around a, a, a large beech tree, A, that beech tree might just fall over because that's what they do. And is it really worth it? And is there any way of, of compensating that? Now, obviously, BNG has really helped and that matters in terms of replacing the number of trees. But on this particular site, the architect hadn't really looked at the overall tree cover and how that was contributing to the conservation area and the sense of place of, 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 of the actual scheme. When they got the landscape architect on, on board, they then worked with the layout and looked at which trees were valuable on the site, what the, tree, the best tree canopy and the cover and from neighbouring and also from the street view and what would the person see at street view. The layout did change, which was, which was quite... You know, a, a, a little bonus that it had changed and had looked at more about keeping a lot more trees around the actual perimeter of the site and they also introduced back in to the centre of the site some more tree planting and this goes back to the sort of landscape character type this morning we were talking about design codes as a landscape architect our design code really is landscape character type analysis which is all you know we refer to that and defer to that when we're doing LVIAs which you know the local authority have got those landscape character types in place for that reason so you're it's like another layer that you have to think about in terms of what is that quality of that landscape in that setting and this particular area obviously was the local conservation area and how the mature trees are read within that context the landscape character areas and landscape character types are really really important in terms of sometimes a, a scheme can come to the panel and they've just plonked landscape everywhere but actually it may be really out of character with the local landscape character type. So we asked them to go back and look at, the, the, the information is there, and the local authority provide the information of, of what is landscape character type on the landscape character area. And this, it's really important because the visual aesthetic of that cannot be understated. So in this particular scheme, they've reduced the amount of vehicle entrances into the scheme, whereas before it was very vehicle heavy. And they, uh, the panel also suggested that perhaps the tree retention be more carefully considered as the visual impact defined the character of the area. They also felt that perhaps some of the trees, the particular ones going down the centre, might not be within character of that local, sort of local space. And perhaps they needed to look at that. However, they did feel that the trees offered overheat, you know, that, that overheating and shade and, and, and a pleasant environment. So here, the, the, the panel, um, the, 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 they brought to the panel... They, they had looked at that scaling and that massing between the buildings and how that would work at, at sort of street level. And we asked them to sort of perhaps consider this in a bit more of greater value, which is great to have this central avenue, but was that in keeping with the, the local landscape character? Was that sense of place there by, by creating this? What sort of space were they hoping to, to create with this? So, yeah, did, did they said that sort of defining the project identified relating to the local environment and conservation area and characteristics and its context and placemaking for the local residents. And this, again, once again, they were looking at how the sense of scale and those trees, but they've sort of looked at it in terms of those trees would always stay that size. So there's, there's still work to be done, because it, it depends on the tree species and how those trees would actually grow, how that space would actually look in sort of 10 to 15 years' time. They'd gone a long way, and it helped define perhaps the location of the buildings on site, but there was still a tiny bit more work to be done. This was their, their pretty plan that they brought to us with lots of trees. And we still felt there were slight issues still with this scheme. So on the second review, we sort of asked them to, to perhaps reconsider the approach. How are you approaching this by foot? How are you approaching this by car? What are you seeing as you enter the site? How are you seeing this from Redcliffe Road along the bottom and on the south here? Wayfinding. How do you find yourself? How do you walk around the site? And at the moment, they've got cars and vehicle access on the right-hand side and car parking on the right-hand side, but the main entrance to the building 
is in that central, you can see almost like dartboard uh, right in the middle there. How do, as a person, if you've never been there before, if you're visiting somewhere, how do you actually find that as an entrance? And they had a lot of what I would call community uh, activities, like the allotments and a gazebo, right at where you would actually arrive. And does that create a good wayfinding experience? Are you creating a good sense of place at that particular moment in time? If you were coming off, off the street through that avenue, do you, does that avenue say to you, oh, yeah, this is where I need to go for the front door? Is this where the bins are? And the other thing, that the, the bin storage on here is that white blob on the right-hand side. So as you are coming in through the car park, one of the first things you see is, is the bin storage. Is that where the residents put all their bins? Is that the commercial bin storage? So there was a few issues still yet to be ironed out with this scheme. The replacement trees were slightly at odds with the local landscape character. And the hierarchy of spaces were better. Um, there were larger, larger spaces, breakout spaces in between the buildings. And obviously the avenue created a bit of a funnel that shaped through. What would that feel like in winter when the wind's blowing? You know, in terms of you're walking through that space, how would it feel? So there were still, you know, and what we tend to find with a lot of the retirement places that there tends to be a requirement to have their own private patio. How do those private patio spaces face onto the public realm? How is that handled? And how does that look from the street? There were quite a few sort of unanswered issues. They had also uh, designed in an orchard to the rear on the northern edge. Are orchards part of this character of this area? Orchards seem to be quite an easy win. People seem to think if you stick an orchard in, you've done your tree, you've done your tree bit. That's not necessarily... The, the, what the landscape character is like in this particular area. They're quite keen for them to, to, to do sort of, um, gardening or grow your own, but the allotment area was at the entrance. And so the, the, there was a bit of disconnect in terms of how those spaces were working for people. But you know, on the prospect, we, you know, we always trying to sort of try and help them um, and not criticise, because I don't think, you know, with landscape it's hard. We normally get value engineered out at the end of the, end of the day. But the scheme had helped to create a more livable and sustainable engaging environment. So it was on the right it was on the right tracks. I think I'm gonna hand over to Bill now for the plan form and how it developed. We reviewed the scheme twice, as I said before, first in September twenty three and then March this year, and it's currently in application. We try and be collaborative and but honest with our approach. So, you know, we're no pushover. If something doesn't work, it doesn't work. One thing I would say is that early on we said to them that three stories plus roof was fine, because that was a prevailing feel in the conservation area. So on the top left, before review, you can see that they've got the um, buildings here. They've got cars screaming everywhere. We, we didn't like that idea. And you can see that they've subdivided the site and, and, and really put an orthogonal approach to it. I think Jonathan touched on in your presentation about the, the urban grain and the direction of the urban grain. If you look at that first one, you'll see that the building in the left-hand left corner is oriented to Rat Ratcliffe Road. And yet... When you look at the wider context, all these buildings actually are quite at an odd angle to the road. They are, they are individual villas that sit there with, within the trees. And similarly, uh, we said that that corner building needed to address the other road. So there was a need to do that, plus the fact I think it was taking a few trees out, and we thought that the trees were better on Radcliffe Road to do that. Our moves were to suggest to them a more coherent plan form. Also, the gaps through, so that you saw spaces within the buildings. If you remember back to the old student residential scheme, redundant student residential scheme that, that Jonathan talked about, that wasn't there, was it? I mean, you know, I think the view of, again, not just from the street, but also from the adjoining owners, the gaps through, the landscaping through, so that you can see, if you look at the top left and then you look at the, the, the bottom, uh, the, the larger one, which was where they are for the application, by the way, you can see that you've got the orientation on the bottom left, is now addressing the street. On this side, it's also at an angle to, to the building immediately adjacent. But also, if you look at the back building, the back building is now um, coherently placed along the axis to the scheme, the entrance. So you've got that sense of, of place that you're starting to create as you see it from the street. You've also got a very big swathe of space running through from side to side. So again, from each adjoining owner, you're getting this spatial awareness and, and feeling of this buildings in, in the tree and landscape. I was just going to say that the, I suppose this is a great example of um, where, as a panel, we combine landscape, urban design, and architectural thinking. So the, the, 
what we tend to think about is we start with the context, we start with things like conservation areas, listed buildings, and looking around the site. And then, as I presented the sort of constraints plan, it's all about trying to tease out from an applicant the, how, how much they've understood the sort of the, their own brief, I suppose, for the site in terms of how those buildings are then going to respond to, to setting, whether that be trees or buildings. And then what Bill's been talking about is the sort of the, the synthesis of those elements, um, the synthesis of thinking about what does Radcliffe Road mean in terms of treescape and in terms of the, the building massing, these large Victorian and Edwardian villas, and how the scheme comes together with all the specialisms combined. And you know, one of the most common things that we might remark on on schemes such as this is that combination thinking, not just architectural thinking, but is the whole team there in terms of thinking about context, thinking about where the scheme has come from, and thinking about how it integrates in landscape terms. And then we start to think about architectural uh, approach and um, how it relates and how that's going to form part of the, the urban landscape. Yeah. Other things that we looked at as well is you can see from the first to the second scheme, on the right-hand side, that small building. That we felt was wrong. Our concern there was we felt that everything was getting congested, congested notwithstanding the, the cars, but the trees, we weren't giving the, 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 the frontage to the site enough space to breathe. We, f we asked them to focus on that central space. It doesn't quite catch it here, but we asked them to close it down, to make it more intimate, to more, more of a pedestrian feel and a more human scale, because that avenue was important. And we also said, if you're going to go into that, and you've got a heart with a, com with a care community of this kind, you've got the bistro, um, the health and fitness, the cafes, and all these facilities. They'd split the buildings into three, but we wanted to create that heart, that, that character within the space. So again, compressing that, but then letting it emerge into the space behind the, 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 in front of the last building was quite important. But coalescing the buildings on the right gave us more, more space to put trees in around the car parking and actually not have it just as a vehicular area that you see through to, but a series of, um, of trees. The other point that we made to them is that they've got two lots of parking here, um, and the major parking clearly is on the right-hand side. And yet, um, in the second review, they came up with the idea of the um, amenity facilities in, the, in, in the, the left central building. So what that did was then put a load of service requirements on that very small hammerhead, which was slightly uncharacteristic, and, and, and really wasn't... It, that's really very much subservient to the rest of it. So what we then said, and well, why don't you flip that to the other side... And what that's done is then made the, the major access and servicing, as you can see, going up the right-hand side. And to come back to one of our earlier speakers, we also suggest it would be quite good to have fire brigade access into this site. So you can see the tail there is actually facilitating the fire brigade access for um, building regulations purposes. So again, that was where, where it got to. So there you are. They're the bullet points that we talked really through. But the hierarchy of landscape spaces to integrate the buildings on the site was quite important. And that was, we felt, the over. The, 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 the major determinant of positioning these buildings on the site. Not, strictly speaking, the conservation and setting, but that was part of the conservation area character. We were keen to make sure that this width or block was actually seen in the street as one component, because it's one care home, or be a number of different buildings. So we were quite keen that they kept some sort of unity between those central buildings that you can see, building 02, building 04, uh, to the side. We wanted them to use their, their modern interpretation of the Victorian uh, features and give visual interest to the street in the way that some of the other mansion blocks within the conservation area have been demonstrated, but otherwise keep it fairly unified because it is one uh, care home and it's one element. Their earlier scheme actually had render, projecting windows, projecting bays, and window proportions changing. And we urged them to try and simplify it. If they were going to do on a Victorian or contemporary expression of Victorian, they did that and kept it very clean and not trying to have a bit of everything. It was a, it was a palette of everything. So the bottom one is the one that they've, they've applied for. And you can see that they've got the gables, they've got the projecting bays, and then the building on the corner is a slightly different interpretation of that. But I didn't put any more slides on. Do you want to comment on? I was just, I was just going to comment on the, the drawing itself. We've got the, the sort of application plan there, and I suppose... Coming back to the sort of contextual point, we, we tend to invite applicants to very much show their proposals in context, which are sort of partly done here in that we've got, 
we've got the landscape of Radcliffe Road and we can see the sort of buildings as a whole, but what would have been perhaps nice on this elevation would be to show the buildings on either side so that we, so that we could actually, they could follow through on our advice, which was about reducing and relating massing to the, the existing buildings. And we've not quite got that here, but um, that was one of the things we asked for, I think. It was. And uh, we also asked them to show the building in the middle at the back, but uh, unfortunately, again, that doesn't make it to the application either. So you can't have it all. I think that gives you an idea of, of how we approach things, but we welcome your questions and thoughts on our views of this scheme, but also whether you think we've got it wrong or not. Because we do invite, when we have these panels, the local authority to contribute and actually make comments and uh, contribute to the session. We actively encourage that, but it's a collaborative session, so we don't just sit there and say, this is what we think. We then open it up to them. And I think one of the things that we do say is, you know, if you still believe in this and you don't want to adopt our suggestions, then tell us and challenge and justify why it is that your approach is the right approach. Because there is no single answer to it today. But it's a synthesis of views for which we try and contribute. And we try and actually assist in terms of them coming up with the best possible design they can for every site. Any questions? My question really would be from your perspective, A, how much additional time do you think that the process of going through the panel added to the application and did you get feedback from the applicant presumably they felt it was good value for money I'm just interested in, in hearing both sides of it you know whether the local authority found it helpful and the application was successful first time rather than having to go back and whether the applicant felt it was helpful in terms of the process from their perspective I, I think I think generally um, I mean, we do a lot of these reviews and as I say I think the three of us have been doing it for about 10 years uh, generally, it's it's very positively received, um, both at the session and and, and afterwards. Um, I say most of our sessions, well, all of our sessions invite uh, the local authority along, and uh, we actually have a sort of a part of the session involves so that the applicant will present, and then we we invite um, whoever's come from the local authority, whether they be planning officers or design officers, to have input at that point, and that might be to tell us about the process or to tell us about. The engagement that's been happening or, or even to uh, talk to us about some of the issues that um, are coming out of the project and, and as an aside to that traditionally a lot of our a lot of the referrals we get for design review panel um, come from local authorities themselves and when I'm sat on the other side of the table I'm currently involved in presenting a lot of my schemes to to, to design review panels in order to inform the process so are they are they useful I mean, we, we tend to get positive feedback from applicants but particularly from local authorities it's been we, the, the feedback we get is that our advice helps to kind of, uh, I, I suppose, broaden their thinking or, or sort of provoke ideas that um, people haven't thought about or question things in a different way or help to kind of work through as a sort of an extra pair of hands, I suppose, that um, contributes to the process. So we, we aim to contribute, we aim to add value, we aim to help steer the process and where there is debate between a, a local planning authority and a an applicant, then you know, we're happy to engage in that process and add to it where we can. Hope uh, that answers the yeah, reason you've got yeah, to Yeah, and it's quite, the, as, as mm. Phil said, we, we never know who's going to be on the panel, which is always really interesting. So we do turn up on site and go, oh, we've got an ecologist on this one. There must be sort of an ecology reason for that. So the panel is very broad, broad in terms of its experience. You might have a transport, you might have an ecologist, a landscape, always have a landscape architect and an architect. You have a planner, someone in private practice, it's a planner. So it, in, in that sense, the, if the planning officer from the local authority does turn up, they can see all different aspects and different responses from, from, the, from the team, from ourselves. Which I think, and for the clients, they find that uh, whoever's brought the scheme to, to the panel do find that quite uh, enriching um, because they think, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that with ecology. So, yeah, we, we, we tend to get quite good feedback because we've got quite a broad scope of professions. I think your question was about quicker. It's an interesting Is it worth the time, I think? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the issue here is that, you know, had some of these not seen a design review, they would have just been straight refused. And so you have to look at it in the context of, you know, how, how long is a piece of string. It's very difficult. I think in terms of the necessity, we find people want to come back um, quite often the second time from the first one. So obviously they hopefully found it rewarding in term, and constructive, which is the aim of the game, not to be 
it's a critique, but it's constructive critique, not a destructive critique, because that's not in anybody's interest. What we want to do is improve the environment, improve the design, the quality of schemes, and the environment we're, we're leaving for our, um, you know, uh, the, the, you know future, generations. future generations. So I hope that answers your question. We do tend to get told where there are there is some local resistance, and we try and assist with that um, but to try and understand what it is. But that's um, that's probably the limit of that because we're really commenting on the design before us, not uh, the peripheral aspects unless they are determinant like conservation areas, listed buildings, and, and context. Okay. Right in front do you ever say no? Like, <laughs> I mean, you've tweaked that one and, and made it work, but has there ever, ever been a scheme where you've gone? No, that's, that's just a no. Yeah, many, many a time. Yes. And um, what we tend to, when, we, when they presented, and each one of us as a discipline give our feedback, and the, the point is we're not meant to tread on other people's toes. So I will never speak about the architecture, and the architecture shouldn't speak about the landscaper. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That never happens. <laughs> <Sometimes. laughs> um, but, and then we have like a breakout um, where the client then goes out to the room, and we have a discussion on our own for about 15 minutes, and we feed that back to them when they come back in. And you tend to find those where the schemes where we're only out of the room for about three or four minutes are the ones that have been really unsuccessful because the designers aren't arguing amongst themselves about what they like and what they don't like and what works and what doesn't work. And that I have sat on quite a few panels where we've gone, we really think perhaps you need to rethink it. Yeah. Um, we're not here to design it for you, but it would be useful if you perhaps take some of the, our suggestions away. Um, I, I can think of many. Yeah. yeah, I think we're always careful to... And the answer is yes, we have, we, we have um, told schemes that we think they need to go away and come back, but we're always very careful to be positive about that, and that means telling them why we think that. And sometimes it's just an absence of the correct sort of baseline or preparatory work, so that there's no site analysis or there's no, or there's no wider landscape analysis. That's, that's a very they common theme, there's no LVIA. Um, or there are significant issues that haven't been considered, such as heritage or listed buildings. So those are probably the most common ones, and it's, it becomes quite easy to see why schemes aren't heading in the right direction uh, just by looking at the absence. But I suppose we are always encouraging, and as, as Bill says, it's positive criticism in that you know, we, we feel that you know, this is a great site, but in order to inform the scheme, you know, ideally we would have X, Y, and Z in terms of, um, of baseline studies. Um, I think... Um, I've only had one scheme where I've tried a panel and we've decided that the scheme just wasn't ready for me. And it's only happened to me once in 10 years of chairing two panels. So usually there's something good to say. I've got a question from online about um, the cost. <laughs> I think, Sarah, you, you touched on that earlier, actually, but um, is, is there a cost associated with these panels? There, there is a cost, yes, um, and, and it varies. So um, I couldn't tell you exactly how much it is um, because these things change all the time. And panels do slightly vary in terms of cost, I believe. But um, I can only answer for our own panel, um, which is that we have a sort of a scale of services which go from a, a sort of an online review where uh, material is submitted and there is a sort of a team-style uh, review. And, although they tend to be for repeat panels where we've already seen the scheme once and we don't feel we need to go to site again, for, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then I think it goes up from there. So we have, I think, a half day where we go and have a look at the site and then we have a full day. So, so we do try and cater for different sizes and scales. Um, I have to say that um, most of the panels that I've sat on and chaired have been a, a half or a full day um, because I, uh, the feeling I get from um, applicants and, and clients who are promoting their own schemes particularly for one-off houses, is they want the design review feedback to be as robust and carry as much weight as possible. Um, and in order to do that, you know, I'm sure you'll all agree that the feeling is that if a panel have been to a site and seen a site and considered everything in the round, then that feedback is going to be much more informed and much more useful to the applicant. Yeah, and sometimes, like uh, as Jonathan was saying, if we're looking at some like Power 84 um, properties that have come to mm. us, they may come to, to us four times which and, and they tend to the administrator tries to keep the same members on the panel so there's a consistency so they're not having to re-explain things um which i think is really important so we, it sometimes it may delay the process in trying to get the right people together and the same team together but it, it, it's really constructive for the clients then at the end of the day um and sometimes when it's come to us the fourth time it may just be a desktop review what's so all the information is given to us and then we sort of almost do a report on that 
but um, certainly it's really interesting with some of the larger ones, if they have come back, to see how the process has changed and how they've listened to some of our sort of uh, our ideas or how we've sort of approached the scheme and how they've interpreted that, um, often for the better. Yeah, I can't, I mean, I, we can't comment on cost because we're not um, the people that organise these things, so we're the people that carry out the reviews. So, but to give you an idea of the, of the range, I, I did one recently for I think it was an hour and a half, two hours, which was looking at a scheme that had failed at appeal, that they'd come back with a revised scheme uh, for a tall building in a uh, harbour setting. Um, and that was a very, we had seen the site, we didn't need to see the site because um, they, they'd sent us a, a visual assessment of the site. And really they were looking for an endorsement of what they had or where they were going after the appeal. So that was a couple of hours. So it depends on what you're asking or what is being asked of us. Very often, but most often it's, it's a one day where we go out, we look at the site in the morning, we ask questions, we wander the site. We, always, we often actually take them places they haven't taken us on the site because we want to see and understand them. And then we have the review in the afternoon. Mm. And we do it voluntary yeah. as well. It's all, it's all voluntary. I suppose yeah. one of the questions that keeps flashing up here is um, how do you join? Do you get a tap on the shoulder from Jonathan at a conference saying, <laughs> you're, you're recruited into my panel? Something about that. I mean, we, I mean what I would say is we're, we're very encouraging of um, different disciplines and, and as much variety as possible, really. Different levels of experience, different, different disciplines. So, uh, you know, they're not looking for... You know, 20, 30 years of experience, or yeah, that's probably what's reflected in front of you. Um, but um, and I've, I've personally recommended lots of other urban designers, um, particularly in different geographical re regions, so that um, I don't have to drive up to you know, sort of uh, North Manchester to do reviews, for example. So, yeah, a lot by recommendation, um, and, and we do have people apply to join. And you know, I think um, Jonathan's keen to, to keep building a variety. This is another Jonathan, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just to you. I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example to answer the question. Is I, was, <laughs> I did um, two design reviews down in Plymouth for a scheme. Subsequently, we went on to get planning but never got built. Um, and uh, about six, nine months afterwards, I was uh, asked by uh, Jonathan, who runs the panel, um, whether I would like to join the panel. I had previously had two invita invitations from other design panels, which I'd refused. Um, uh, and uh, having been working in the industry for 30 years, um, I actually like the approach that they took when they reviewed our scheme, and you can imagine it wasn't an easy ride because we had two reviews to get there, um, and the local authority in there. So I was just invited after that um, to give some comments, etc. Oh. Shall I read it? So, so why would you do a design panel compared to LPA pre-app, who have more local understanding? Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> You're on the clock here, okay? So it's not it's not, an, it's not a half day session. May I start and, yes. and hand, hand over? Um, so yeah, lots of personal experience here where. Um, Currently um, working with a, uh, a local authority with a, an excellent urban design officer um, and we're doing design review panels as well and I think the consensus as an applicant team is that it's good to get some variety, it's good to get multidisciplinary input um, and, it's, and it's hopefully mutually beneficial for the LPA urban design officer and the um, and the design panel, uh, and when we have a review, we all sit in the same room and I present the proposals and the local authority design, and design officer is there, uh, as are the design panel, and everyone contributes and I think it um, expands the process. So uh, these tend to be larger strategic schemes and I think um, you know, the more hands, the, the better and hopefully um, it, it's helpful for that urban design officer to, um, to get a wider view. Also, a lot of local authorities have lost their landscape architects, ecologists, conservationists, they just aren't there, so it's useful to have those on the panel um, for the local planning authority to, to just see what their views are. Um, we, we find, you know, we just haven't got, the, the, the local authorities haven't got that resource in-house. I think, I think um, as an architect and a planner, um, I think uh, that there is a need for design um, advice on particular sites um, to assist the local authority in their, their deliberations because I think um, we've heard today about building regulations and all sorts of other aspects. Well, a design panel can touch upon those um, and help and assist the local authority. And whether that's to refuse an application or to approve an application, it just gives it added weight um, in terms of that advice. So I can see the work two working together, but I don't think a, a, the, the pre-app is largely policy-driven and yes, there are design issues, but at the time you're getting a pre-app, you're not necessarily seeing the design challenges that await because they aren't there in front of you. Whereas architects and the design panel can see those challenges that are perhaps potentially coming over the horizon. Um, and so I think, again, the multidisciplinary approach is a good one. 
and I think it gives that design and, and a sustainability edge very early on in the process. And just a, another very brief anecdote, if I may, that um, my client was keen to take our um, master plan to, to the panel uh, for 200 homes. And the reason that uh, we went to panel was because we had a great planning officer, but they said, well, we don't have a urban design officer. And um, we're keen to be robust on design so that when we um, you know, take this scheme through application and uh, make our recommendation, uh, we're able to add some design weight to that. Um, the, so, yeah, the, the, the panel input was invaluable, and although the scheme was eventually approved through uh, the appeal process, there was no design reason for refusal, and um, there was confidence amongst officers that um, we'd been through that robust design process.